Welcome back to the Fearless Future Podcast. I am your host, Glenn. And I'm Amber. And we're here today to talk about wholesaling and how it's being banned all over the country in many states right now. Yeah, the next iteration of the cancel culture. Yeah, now they're canceling people that are in business. Although I don't disagree with it because, because people have been in this space for a long time and doing it wrong and causing a lot of chaos for people to do it professionally like us. So maybe there shouldn't be a, a cancellation of it, but a modification of it. Well, there is. I mean, let's let's talk about it. They, there is. They're trying to make people get licensed, and we can talk about that, but I think yeah. we should probably back up and first talk about uh, what wholesaling is. People don't always know. They hear that term. Yeah. It's funny, when we first started back in 2008, that wasn't even a thing. Yeah, and even when we heard of it, we had no interest in it. At right, first. right. We thought it was used car salesman stuff. Right. And it kind of is, but it's, but it, it, it has evolved into a business model that some people, that's their only model. Right. All they do is that's all they like, do. like we, we flip houses, we hold on to rentals. We do all that. Plus we do wholesaling. It's one of our exit strategies. It's one of them. As a matter of fact, it's the major one that we use actually. Yeah. And so I think we should tell people what it is. So first off, describe wholesaling to everybody. Yeah. So wholesaling is when you go and put a house under contract. And then you sell that contract to another potential buyer. You what know, do, maybe that buyer is another investor. What do you mean sell a contract? What do you mean sell a contract? So let's let's give some actual numbers here. So let's say that you go and you find a house and you put it under contract with the seller for for easy numbers. Let's just say a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so I'm going to buy the house for a hundred thousand dollars. We're not buying it. You're putting it under contract for a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so I'm 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 trying to buy it for a hundred thousand. I walk in with the with the impression I'm going to buy the house. Right. And okay. so, well, there's, there's language that you use with the buyer to, or to the seller to let okay. them know, you know, that you're not doing anything unethical. Okay. So you go out and you find, usually it's another investor, not necessarily a homeowner, but it could be, but you're usually going out and finding another investor that wants to buy that house. And let's say you can sell it to them for $130,000. What kind of investor? So they're, what that's kind of a, a buyer are they? That that's somebody that may want to flip the house themselves. They may want to hold on to it for a rental. How do they buy it? So they go to the, I'm, they, I'm quizzing you. I know you are. So when you go to the closing table. No, no. How do they buy it? They How buy do, the contract. With what? With their money. What kind of money? Cash. Okay. Usually cash. So it's not a loan. So it's not, not typically a loan. Got it. So when you go to the closing table, you don't bring any of your own money to the table. The buyer is bringing all the money, but you have them under contract to purchase it for $130,000 but your contract with the seller is for $100,000. So that leaves a $30,000 spread. So they bring, the, the new buyer brings the money, the seller gets their $100,000, and then you get the $30,000 spread. Okay. That's what a wholesale is. So some common questions right out of the gates are, why in the world would I pay you $130,000 for a house that you paid $100,000 for? Why would I ever give you that much money? Because there's still enough meat on the bone to do a renovation or whatever they need to do with it for them to make a profit too. So it's like a commission. Kind of. Okay. I mean, it, it's more of a spread than a commission, but right. it's not based on a percentage. So I think it's important people understand that though, that, that how we stumbled onto that was interesting because yeah. we were, I don't know, maybe in our fifth year, sixth year, and we bought a house in a neighborhood and we got a phone call from someone who said, hey, we want to buy that house. You know, And I don't remember the numbers. Let's say we paid... 70,000 and she said I'll give you 75 I'll give you 5,000 more than you paid for the house. Now that was in that particular deal we actually had just closed on the house. Right. So this was this is kind of how it evolved in our world. We had actually closed on that house for But we did buy it. We did buy it. And we we're going to do it for renovation. And literally within a week of closing we got a phone call from a woman who said I'll give you 5,000 over what you paid for the house without you don't have to touch it. Remember we said what? Yeah. Like, like what, what that, do you what do you mean you're gonna give us money for not touching the house? But that that's that led to well if you give me seventy five you'll give me ninety. Now she said no 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 but I'll give you. And we negotiated back and forth. And I think we made like twelve thousand dollars selling the house to her without ever touching it. Right. And we said to ourselves, well that was interesting. Like, right. After all the fees and stuff were done, we still made around maybe nine thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars profit. So that technically wasn't it. a wholesale because I, we actually purchased the Let house. Let me evolve into yeah. it. Let me evolve. So, so we, that's, that was the first, first time we were introduced to, Hey, we can actually not do work on a house right. and make money selling it. Then we bought a house 
in the hood for a dollar. Yep. Remember that house? Oh, I, I remember it. Dead carcasses in it. <laughs> there were carcasses. There were lots of stuff Graffiti. in it. And now here's, here comes the question on that. Why in the world would somebody sell you a house for a dollar? Do you remember the situation? I totally remember the situation. They had inherited the house yep. and they didn't want to pay the taxes. The taxes were like four or five grand a, a year. year. Yeah. And they didn't want the burden of it. And the house was in the hood. It was not in a desirable area. Yes. And it was very dilapidated. Yes. Like literally there was graffiti all over the house, all sorts of dead animals in the house. You know, the walls were bashed in like they, the people that inherited it just didn't want it. And I remember the agent that we had working for yes, us correct. called you and said, Hey, this seller said they'd sell us, to, sell us the house for a dollar. How much should we offer them? And you're like a dollar. <laughs> and the agent followed me and said, let's give her a thousand. I go, why would I give her a thousand? We should take a dollar. Yeah. Like she doesn't want to pay $5,000 a year in taxes. Right. I think she had paid it for a few years. So she was losing money. Right. Just give me a dollar and I'll give you the house. So we said, okay. And nobody could get a mortgage on the house because there was like no kitchen. It was so dilapidated. So the first thing I said to her was, will you do some owner financing on that for the dollar? <laughs> you did not. <laughs> <laughs> Take payments for the next 10 years of that. We, we could do that. One no. penny. <laughs> but, I, but I remember saying, okay, so we wrote up a contract for a dollar and we did not close on the house. And during that time, I started to market that to other people. And I, I started marketing for $10,000. And I finally found somebody who said, I'll buy it for $5,000. Right. And I remember going to their house. They were like Pakistani or something. I remember going to their house on, a, I think it was Christmas Eve. It was a holiday Eve. I think it was Christmas Eve. And the, the aroma of the food in the house was just overwhelming. And I, I sat in this house that night. It was very dark. And they wrote a check for $5,000 I had to take to my attorney's office. But I essentially sold that contract for $5,000. It cost me a dollar. So after all the fees and stuff were done, we ended up making like $4,000 in that deal. And I never owned the house. Right. And that was an aha moment for you and I. Right. But we didn't like it. We felt like used car salespeople. Yeah, it, 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 we, it, we felt like in, at the time, we felt like it almost lacked integrity because we loved the before and after. We loved yes. taking that house and, and taking an ugly house and turning it into something beautiful. But like, as we started looking at the right way to do it right. and the, the way to do it with integrity and then letting people know up front what you're doing, which is you're basically a matchmaker. You're, you're matching a buyer and a seller and you're getting the profit in the middle. Well, I think what, what you're trying to say is that so, so unethically speaking, right. what a lot of people did back in the day and, and some people still do why they still do this. I have no idea there it's, you're doing it. You're doing it wrong if you're doing it yeah. this way. If you put a house in your contract and you don't tell the people that you're going to go find a third party buyer for them, and then you bring people in under the guise of, hey, this is going to be uh, my contractor coming in. This is going to be just a friend of mine looking through the house. It's going to be an inspector coming through and it's a potential buyer. Right. You're lying to the seller and then you have no integrity. Right. So that's what has happened for many, many years. And we decided way back before, way back 10 years ago. Because somebody was trying to sell us a house that way. Yes. And, and, they, and you were like, um, no, I'm not going to go well, in let's, there. Let's yeah. describe that way. Cause you kind of just threw that out there as a, that way we walked into a house with a wholesaler and he said, if anybody asks, you're the contractor. Yes. And I said, dude, I am not going to lie at who I am. Right. I said, we are on TV for God's sakes all the time here. We're and even if we weren't, that wouldn't have mattered though. Like we just weren't going to be but dishonest in a house. Well, of course. With, I was, a, with a potential I wasn't seller. saying we're going to, what I am saying is that we would, we were known. And so I'm not going to be, and you're right. I wouldn't, even if I wasn't known, I wouldn't right. do that, but it was going to be like, someone's going to recognize us and say, wait a minute, you're not a contractor. And right away, we all, we all lose integrity and that's not going to happen. I said, I'm not going to offer the information, but if they ask, I'm going to tell them I'm a cash investor here looking at the property. Yeah. Cause that's what I am. So we decided to do it differently. So we, st we decided with our business to say, okay, we're going to tell people right up front that we're going to put your house under contract. Now I'm going to go find a third party buyer. I might close on it myself because I might. I might convert it to a rental property. I might convert it over to, I might sell it to myself or flip it to myself to one of my other entities that I have that has a, a, um, rentals and holding properties. Or I might bring in one of my cash investors that I work with, or I might sell it to anybody on my list of other cash buyers I have in the capital region. But either way, you get your money. Right. Most everybody says, well, yeah, why wouldn't I say yes to that? Yeah. So it's a very, you know, you're going to get your price, let's say $100,000. I'm going to market it for more, but that's going to cover all my costs and what I do in my business. So that's what we started doing. I think we should let the folks know at home that, you know, we, we out of our business, out of 100 plus deals a year, about 70, 
to 74% of those deals are all wholesale deals now. And remember why we started to? We used to be like, in, in the very early days, we would get a, a house in the in the hood yep. or in the inner city or too far away. Neighborhoods that we didn't like, or maybe we had too much going on. All our money was tied up. You know, right. all of our private investors were tied up into deals. We didn't have the money to actually do another house at the moment. So we would say no. Or the capacity, yeah. People would say, we have a deal for you. We'd say no. And then one day I'm like, wait a minute, we're paying for the phone to ring here and we're cherry picking deals and we could make money off these deals that will yes. allow us to market to find more good deals. Yep. What are we doing? That's not a real business model. We should make, if we're spending money to make the phone ring in, we should capitalize and turn Maximize that into money. Maximize every lead, every way possible. So we decided to go ahead and do that. And it's funny, I was talking to a woman yesterday, one of our students, and um, she really wanted to focus on, on rentals and flips. And she's like, I don't really think I'm interested in wholesales. And because she didn't really know what it was about. So when I explained it to her and I said, look, it's a really good exit strategy to have in your pocket. You know, it doesn't have to be your primary focus, right. but it's still a really good thing to know how to do because of that exact scenario. Yeah. You know, you're not necessarily going to want to do every deal that comes across your desk for one reason or another, being the bad neighborhood, being, you know, too far away or capacity or whatever. Yeah. It's still a good exit strategy to have to maximize the income that's coming in. I want to talk about a lot more about wholesaling and I want to talk about why it's being banned in the States and what we think should be done about it and kind of how, how to navigate around that right now so you can still make money in that business. Yeah. But I think we have to take a quick pause out here and talk about, uh, do our segment on stupid human comments. So we have a lot of I people, love this part. a lot of people come in and uh, they, people online are fearless these days. They have no problem being a keyboard warrior from their, oh, little, yeah. their little couch where they put all their, you hurt my feelings, all this crap they do. So. We like to have a segment called Stupid Human Comments where we pick out a comment that somebody made on a previous post that we had and then discuss them a little bit. And uh, since they made their name publicly, we're going to go ahead and show that right now. Yeah, so it, it's funny that some of them are keyboard warriors in the sense that they're fearless. Some of them are just plain dumb, though. Like, <laughs> so, so, listen, so tell them, about the, give them the so context yeah. on, the, on the post. Okay, what was it, the post was so, about, about. so this post was uh, about squatters yes. that, that were going into houses and obviously squatting. So, all right. So this comment is from one, um, one unripe mango, 1858, and there's no image available. I mean, you First know, not. shocking. So this comment is, you know, interestingly enough, if you just get an actual job instead of getting people who are poorer than you to fund your entire lifestyle, you never actually have to deal with potential squatters. Hope this helps. Hey, so number one, I have no idea what that even means. We'll talk about that in a minute, but what's the, so, what the comment right so below it was. Thank you, Devin Kelly, 2399. Um, I really do like your comment. His comment was, this is a stupid comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, as you read that comment, I thought to myself, this is a person who said, why don't you go get a job instead of being a job creator? We, we have dozens of employees. And we've certainly employed hundreds of people over the years. This person wants us to get a job Instead of getting people that are poorer than us, which I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't either. We provide housing for people. Like, and they, and, and people think, well, if we provide housing, we should, you should just do it for everybody. This is the socialist mentality we I live mean, in these days. I mean, it just makes everybody, no sense. Like, they, the, they the comment makes work, no sense. We work, they deserve it, right? You know, you're richer than I am, so you deserve it. So, oh, it, but then at the end, they say, hope this helps. Yeah. Thank I'm, you for your advice, yeah, Unripe really Mango. So, so that was your episode today of the stupid human <laughs> comments of the week. So, yeah. All right, so let's go back to wholesaling and talk more about that. Question is, how much money can you make on wholesaling? And our average wholesale spread, I think, in New York and our business is what? About fourteen thousand. Fourteen, right? yeah, 14, fourteen 15. to eighteen thousand yeah. dollars per per deal. deal that we do. When we first started, we were only doing five thousand at a minimum that we would do, and sometimes they were smaller, and sometimes they're small when you first start. But yeah. you know, we've had them as high as close to eighty thousand dollars, and seventy-eight thousand is our highest wholesale spread on yeah. one deal that we on a house we've never owned. And we've done some for around five grand. Five grand, it, it almost doesn't, it's not worth it because it costs so much for the lead in the first place. But uh, you can make a lot of money doing that. Let's talk about what an assignment is versus a double close. Yeah. So an assignment is what you just said. An assignment is I put a house under contract with you for $100,000. I go out and find a buyer for 130. And then at the closing table, my name never goes on any documents. I never own the house. In other words, any, any filed documents. My, my it goes name is, on the check. <laughs> it goes on the contract and the check, right. So essentially, the end buyer brings the 130, like you said, 
and a hundred thousand gets dispersed to the seller because it was their house, and the the thirty thousand left over on the table is mine. Now there's fees and stuff that come out of that, but for the most part, that's the simplicity of how it works. Right. That's an assignment. So when you open the newspaper the next day that records all the deeds and houses that have transferred ownership, your name is not on that because it, it's an assignment of contract. You assigned a contract to somebody else. That is what is il- getting to be illegal in many states. South Carolina just banned it. I know Oklahoma yeah. last year banned it. If you look online, they say about 10 different states have banned it, but I think there's legality versus reality because I don't right. know that they all enforce it. But I do think that there are some very stringent laws in South Carolina that can shut you down also in Oklahoma mm-hmm. that I know of. And there's other states that are doing, and other states are going to try and follow suit. I'm sure it's because, you know, real estate agents have whined that people are out there doing it better than them. Like they're finding these rundown houses that they didn't want to touch before, right? Wholesalers fill a need. Right. Wholesale, let's be honest. If you're a real estate agent, you really don't, for the most part, most agents, and I know we're going to get some hate on this probably, but that's okay. Most agents want to do nicer homes that sell faster. That's the ideal yeah, it thing. It takes the same amount of work to sell a $700,000 house than it does to sell, you know, a hundred thousand dollar house. Right. But the commission's a whole lot bigger on the seven hundred thousand dollar house. A, it's so why wouldn't they want to focus their time right. on the higher end? It's house. probably easy. It's easier to sell the bigger house. Probably. Yeah, the bigger, the bigger, nicer house, easier right. to sell. So we we come in as wholesalers, we feel a need for people that have a hoarder house. It's run down, it's beat up, it's vacant. They have to get out. They don't want to clean it. They don't want to make repairs. They don't want to fix it. And most agents don't want to deal with that. No. And I, and and if you know some people say, "Yes, I do." Well, then you don't make any money as an agent. Right. Then you're you're a broke agent for sure. If you focus only on those deals, you have to do hundreds of them a year to make any kind of yeah, significant income. Yeah, you crank out some serious volume. Because you get paid a percentage of the sale price. So I understand why there's a need for that. So wholesalers came in and started to figure out how to do this. Again, we've been doing it for a long time, and now it's become a way that a lot of people do business, and a lot of people shouldn't be doing business because they're not doing it the right way. No, I, I think with that being said, though, there's also the you know every now and then, even as a wholesaler, you hit a home run, you know, so you might find a, a house that comes across your desk that is one that an agent would have liked to get gotten their hands on. Maybe. So maybe sure. that's the part that's you know pissing some of those agents off and making them. Yeah, it could be. I'm sure they don't like it. And I'm sure they, you know, just like in our, in our world right now, whoever cries the loudest, they all get what they get exactly what they want. You know how it was for us with the, remember just a side, a side, remember the Airbnb debacle we had? Oh yeah. We had one One neighbor. neighbor. She cried and cried and cried and cried. I don't like the garbage cans by the street. Every day she cried to the town. So they called a whole board meeting over one lady. Yep. Because who was complaining? And we we showed up with fifty people and shut her the hell up. That we was did. pretty good, but yeah. but nonetheless, that's the world we live in. Right. So the people who cry the loudest get whatever they want because we don't want to hurt their feelings. So they never make it to the Gen Xer. So I look forward to our Gen X section coming up here in just a minute. But so assignment of contract. We I digress, right? Let's we we assignment of contracts when you just sign the paper. A double close is different. Now double close what we used to always do until we realized we were paying an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars per transaction. Right. And when you're doing 50 transactions a year, it's a lot of money that you were paying. A double close means we go to the closing table and actually what happens is the money from the seller, that 130,000 you talked about, that seller brings the money. We actually take title to the house with their money at the closing table. And then we sell that house to the end buyer. So we actually, if you look up in the newspaper the next day, we are on title as being an official owner of that property. And that brings me to this. Through my research, I figured out that the banning of wholesaling that they're trying to do, one of the ways they're doing it successfully is saying that you cannot market a home that you do not own. So that gets very sticky because if, if you say, okay, I, I'm going to double close this house, meaning that I am, I am not going to sell a house that I don't own. I'm going to actually own it for five minutes. That's literally what you're going to do. But if you say, um, I I wonder if that's going to get a little stickier because if you can't market a house that you don't own. Correct. If you don't own it yet. Right. Now, I can tell you this. Which that that elongates Holes, that cycle. Wholesalers will figure out ways around this. They'll figure out how to get their names on title with people. It'll get stickier and messier, in yeah. my opinion, a lot stickier because they're going to figure out ways to do that. There's ways you can put a house in an LLC and then just sell the LLC as a whole. So there's a lot of clever ways you can do this, but again, it gets more complicated and complex. Right. But the best way around it is become an agent. Mm-hmm. 
That's what they're saying is if you are a real estate agent, you can do this transaction because you are licensed in that state to do so. And so that has been the workaround in every state. Now, thankfully, we own a brokerage, so it's not going to affect us in any way, shape or form if they decide to do that in New York. Right. And so if they do, we're, we already do it ethically because we're already a broker. But the thing I like is that all of our competition who are not brokers are going to be out of the business. Yeah. They can't do it anymore. And it's a good thing, really. Not that I wish ill will on anybody because competition is always good in business. But what amateur wholesalers do is they give sellers false hope because they go in and they give them way too high of a price, right? That's what we see over and over in our yeah. team. They're like, they're like, hey, I found a house. We'll sell you. It's, we, we got, how much are you under contract for? I'll sell it to you for $200,000. We're like, $200,000? What, what did you sign the contract for? $195,000. Yeah. I'm like, the house, is, the house is worth, you know, maybe two, 210 when it's finished. There's no room for anybody right. because they didn't do their job. They didn't buy it. We always say you make your money when you, when buy. you buy. If they didn't buy it right and they went, they went really low on it, then, or, or they, didn't, they didn't go low enough on it, there's no money for anybody. And now the seller thinks that's what the house is worth. Right. So a seller digs their feet in, they don't sell for six months. Now they fall farther behind. It just becomes a real mess and they've caused more chaos than anything else, these, in these amateur hour wholesalers. Yeah, because some people get into this and, and to some people making a $5,000 spread is fine for them. They're like, oh, yay, I just had a big payday. But yeah. like when you're doing this as a business, you realize there's a, you have a lot more skin in the game. You have overhead, your lead costs, and yeah. all of that. $5,000 is nothing. So you don't want to you don't want to go into wholesaling to make five thousand dollars spreads. No, because you, you'll go out of business right. because it costs more to market to find right. those spreads in the first place. If it costs you four thousand dollars in marketing to find a deal and you make five thousand, you're not making enough money to right. survive. So people don't understand the business side of it to do it at scale. Right. Like we do. So it's a it's a big deal. Hey, let's take a minute and do a pause for our Gen X lost memories. We call it the Gen X lost memories because, frankly, as we get older, I walk into another room and have no idea what I was in there for for like five minutes. So I walk in and go, what the hell did I walk in here for? You just did that this morning on the way here with your keys. Yes, I did. Yes. I walk out the car and go, yeah, I forgot something. I forgot my keys. So, so the Gen X Lost Memories morning, we're going to play a movie clip for you. And then let's see if we can uh, guess which one it is. Pretty obvious, but let's go. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> prepare to die. My name is Antigro Mentoyo. You, you killed, killed my, my father. father. Prepare, prepare to, to die. die. What movie? That is from The Princess Bride. Yeah, The Princess that is Bride. A classic. Uh, we showed that to our kids not too long ago. Yeah, it's a great yeah. movie. It, it stood the test of time, that's for sure. I love that movie. That actor, Mandy. Mandy Patinkin. Mandy Patinkin. That's why he was so angry. His father named him Mandy. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what it was, but it's an interesting male name. So Mandy. What was the show we used to watch that he was in? Really serious show with Claire oh, Dane. Homeland. Homeland. That was such a good show. We watched Homeland. And do you know, remember he was, he was like her boss, yes. the CIA. Yeah. Or he had different roles, but he was yeah. high up in the CIA. And he was a very serious actor. Yeah. Even though it's been. Great actor. What, 35 years or 40 years since that role. Do you know, every time I'd see him speak all serious. You all would I think could, of that line. I did. All I could think of him was going, my name is Antigua Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. That's all I could think about when I saw him. I thought I couldn't take him seriously the whole time. He's a oh, great he actor. He's a good actor. I know he's a great actor, but yeah, he's been in another, another, other movies over the years, but in other TV shows. But that's our Gen X Lost Memories moment for today. So hopefully you enjoyed that. So we know a lot of our followers and are Gen Xers. If you Gen-Xers. haven't seen that movie, you got to watch it. Gen Xers are born, what, 19. Uh, Six, 65, to 65 to what? To 1980. 80, okay. We were raised in the 80s, partied in the 90s, and way you go. Then yep. we, uh, that's, we're the, we're the toughest generation alive. We so are. We are. We're, we are the toughest generation alive without question. I mean, obviously, my dad's generation was, was very, very tough. The World War yes. II generation. That was the, uh, what do they call that generation? The baby boomers? Was well, that, well that's that, not, was about, that was a generation before. Yeah, genetics. but they call them the last, the last something generation, but the last, whatever. That, that was a really, really strong group. It People was. proud and protect your country. and. The silent generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, let's jump back to one more little, just a few more thoughts on wholesaling and, you know, the movement to ban them. Again, I think it's going to wind up being a nationwide, it's a state by state thing. They can't yeah. do a nation. It's going to be a state by state thing. And it just depends on who has the strongest legislation in those markets and what they want to do. I think wholesalers do, like we said before, an amazing job, the right ones. And I think the ones who do it wrong 
are amateurs and they can really gum up the work. So I think it's important that, you know, some practical advice. If you, if you want to be a wholesaler, stay up to date on what it's going to take in your state legally. Make sure that you know before you go in and start trying to do deals because you can get in trouble. And just remember that honesty is the best policy. You know, if you're going in to a, a person, you know, and you're, you're putting their house on a contract with the seller, don't be sketchy about it. Like you can get plenty of deals oh, yeah. by being honest and upfront and letting them know this is what you're doing. You're going to find another buyer for their house. Yeah. And you have that network. I so think, I think that's how most people are doing it now. I if, if there are educators out there right now that are teaching to still go in and be dishonest. I think that they're going to be out of business in no time because you can't be a successful wholesaler being dishonest like that. You just can't. People will sniff you out in two seconds. So if you're going to do it, I as bet a it business, still happens. I, I don't know why, but I'm sure I'm sure that it does. But I, I don't think you should. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to find very soon that states will start to find ways to ban them, shut them down. They'll get stronger, just like anything. They have they decide where to put their focus and they decide what they're pissed off at, at the moment. Yeah. So somebody somebody cries loud enough, some realtor or cries right loud person. enough, some seller cries loud enough, or yeah, they do it to the right person, somebody high up in legislation all, or in the legislative body, all of a sudden, right. boom, you're gonna have that. It's gonna be a big thing. So so again, stay up to date on legalities, consider getting licensed. Yeah. Um, and like you said, be professional at all times if you wanna be a wholesaler. But the ban is coming. There's no question about that. The ban's coming. You have to decide which side you want to be on. A very lucrative side of the business, but you're going to have to do it right. You can't just be a, a riffraff kind of uh, investor anymore, which is good because that'll up everybody's game around here and help them do their business like we do, which 100%. is professional. Yes. All right. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you enjoyed that, make sure you click that like button and also make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything in the future.